Peter Courtney, a little bit about myself. Um, a little less than five years ago, I graduated from Notre Dame with undergrad in mechanical engineering. And since then, I've worked as a mechanical engineer up in Westchester. Um, right now, I'm almost done with my MBA. I'm going for management with a focus on entrepreneurial studies. Um, and in the meantime, I've been kind of home brewing and toying with the idea of opening a brewery in Iowa. You know, and I thought this class was a great fit for, you know, actually giving myself the push to, to work toward that. So uh, I'm going to talk first about the business concepts like the others, then I'm going to talk about my implementation, and then market validation, and then, you know, during the market validation, I'll hand out some beer if you guys are interested in trying it. So craft beer is pretty popular right now. It's, um, it's grown by 10% a year for the last eight years. And I'm sure you guys have all heard of Sam Adams and Brooklyn Brewery, and some of you may have heard of Sierra Nevada or Saranac. And even the big breweries are getting involved, like Anheuser-Busch has Shock Top, which is really popular now. And Miller Coors has Blue Moon, which are, you know, it's actually the most popular craft style of beer. And so the, map, the market share for craft beer is really growing. As you can see, over the last 15 years, it's more than doubled. And when we're talking about billions of bottles a year sold in beer, that's, that's a pretty substantial amount. And the trajectory is also going up, too, which is a good thing. You know, it's kind of stagnant right here. But really, the education of the consumer and Sam Adams being a big player with commercials and everything like that, just educating the consumer on the quality of craft beer over the mainstream beers, um, it's really helping the, uh, the industry. How do you define the craft beer? So craft beer, there's, there's you know, a definition like um, you, you have to use a certain set of ingredients, like the, the malt. Um, you have to have malt, you have to have um, hops, and you have to have water and yeast. And the traditional breweries like the Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors, they kind of like um, splice it with like corn and stuff and rice, make it you know, not natural. The, the craft beer, you have to have just those four ingredients, nothing else normally. And it also defines the craft beer as selling less than two million barrels per year, which, you know, Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors are way above that. And, um, Santa is just, just on the cusp. Um, so there's been an overall movement in beverages for higher quality, and that's not only beer, that's in wine, that's in liquor, that's in coffee, everybody's seen it. So people just want a better quality product, and that's what's helping the craft beer movement. So my concept is to open up a 10-barrel brew house distribution brewery in eastern <coughs> Iowa. And as you can see from the map, the name gets, its, gets from Wapsie River, uh, where that meets, where that intersects with Highway 67, right on the eastern or, uh, border of Iowa, which is right on the Mississippi. And with that size brew house, you know, that, if you brew one time a day, that'll give you around 4,000 barrels per year. And if you brew three times per day, that'll give you around 10,000 barrels per year. And just to give you an approximate order, because I don't know if you know what that means, you know, you could sell a barrel of beer for around $430. So. That's about 4.3 million in revenue. That would be the max with that size root house. And so initially, most of the revenue will have to come from a tasting room on site because before I can uh, get a relationship with the distributor and get you know a fan base in the area, most of the sales will come from the tasting room. And I plan on serving food there. My wife's family actually owned a store in the area where they serve something called a bark burger. It's like a it's like a sloppy joe, and it's kind of they have the recipe for it. And so I was thinking about serving that with potato chips because it's easy to make. You can prepare it beforehand, and it's it's good. I mean, and plus the brewery won't smell like meat. You're cooking meat. You can prepare it beforehand, and then with the beer, um, you know, serve that in sample like three ounce glasses, yeah. as well as pinting by sixteen ounce glasses if you like. Yeah. And so the keys for success I and mean, quality products that. Seems pretty obvious, but that's not just the beer, that's the overall atmosphere and the product in general. Um, getting someone to come to a brewery is, you know, it can be fairly difficult, but it's kind of interesting. Getting them to come back for the second time, that's very difficult. So you need a good beer, you need to change the beer menu up, you need to have unique beers, and good food and a good atmosphere. The other thing uh, is a positive image. And this can be, you know, using sustain, or <clears throat> sorry, using um, sustainable products or being sustainable or energy conscious. Um, something similar to Do Good 
have a good do good approval, something like that, you know, where you use the spent grains, you give it to a local farmer where they can feed their cattle, uh, you recycle, you compost, um, you use recycling materials in your construction and in your um, products. Um, the other thing is local, to, to get a following in the local area in the community, because that's where you're really going to start the business and then it's going to expand out. And to do that, you can do things like volunteer or donate in the area or host charity events. One thing I had in mind is in the area, it's, running is a big thing. So I was thinking about a charity river run where you had like a trail along the Wapsie River and you could donate to the local environmental fund, something like that. And the brewery would be the, the hosting party. Uh, so the demographics, I got this information from uh, the, the Craft Brewers Association. So Mostly men are drinking beer, but one in four women are women, <clears throat> and they're more interested in craft beer than regular beer. And it's actually moving more toward um, closer to one half of craft drinkers of beer, or, uh, or sorry, for women. And um, you know, which is something I got to think about when I'm marketing. Another thing about the household income, it's it's higher because it costs more to make craft beer, so it's going to cost more to buy <coughs> craft beer. So you're targeting people with disposable income. And as you can see, um, someone who makes more than fifty thousand dollars is three times as more likely to buy your product. And the age—it's mostly people in their thirties, forties, and fifties, because these are the people with disposable income. But actually, the younger, the twenty-one to thirty-four, that segment is growing because people want to try new things. That that particular age group, um, millennials, they're interested in trying new things, uh, unique experiences, and and you know. Having quality products as well. You meant 65 plus on the green? Yes. Yeah, so even older people like to drink craft beer as well. Um, so this is my buddy Ken. And he's pretty much a stereotypical craft beer drinker. He's 35, he's Caucasian, he has a house, he's married, he has a master's degree, he likes wine, he shops at Whole Foods, he works for an energy conservation company. He works out, he loves Facebook, and he likes to try new things. So he wants to try the newest beer that your brewery has. That's why you need to change your lineup up. So uh, for the implementation, um, I'm planning to open the brewery in 2014. So as far as implementing a product, the only thing I could do was home brewing and then working on the business plan for it. So I have just, uh, just you can see for the home brewing purposes, some bottles of beer, empty bottles that you can see what the labels look like. I have some grains, caramel grains that um, you actually mash up and you make your beer with. And then the hops, this green stuff with the hops, this is what gives the beer like the aroma and the taste. That's the grain, that's that's where you get most, that's where um, that's where the yeast converts the sugars from. You get the sugars from the malt. This is the hops. This is what gives it like the flavor and the aroma. It kind of smells like flowery. It's a certain type. There's very there's a bunch of different strains of it, but I'm sure you'll like the, the smell of that if you're into beer at all. So in the last seven, ten months, I've brewed seven beers: um, two pale ales, a brown ale, stout, porter, wheat, and India pale ale. I brought two pale ales for you guys today. If you want to try them at the end of the class. <clears throat> it takes about you know four weeks to brew the beer so within this time period of this class I brewed three beers um, two pale ales and the India pale ale so for implementation I actually when I was in Iowa for Thanksgiving I went to a bunch of different warehouses to look for a place where I can might actually open up the brewery and I found a location in a city called Davenport which is a pretty for the area it's you know, people are pretty well off. It's it's a smaller city. It's kind of like White Plains, maybe a little even bigger than White Plains. And as you can see, there's four local breweries in the area. And there's a reason that the breweries are there because people are interested in craft beer. And it's actually a good thing to have breweries in the area because really what you want to do is educate the public on craft beer because you want to take them away from the mainstream beer and move them to craft beer. So the more breweries in the area, actually, the better. Plus, you can do kind of like a, a beer trail, like like wine trails out there. And so this is just a, a rendering of, of the front of the building um, that I put together. And you really want to create an atmosphere, kind of like a, 
a relaxing place to hang out with an outdoor space. You know, people go to the brewery to drink beer, but it's not like a bar. You don't want a bar atmosphere. You want a place to relax. So I'm thinking on Saturdays, you had loud music, like maybe an acoustic guitar, someone singing, kind of like wineries do. And the outdoor space have like a bocce ball or cornhole or bags, whatever you want to call it. Just a mellow place to hang out, drink different types of beer, enjoy food, talk with your friends and, and hang out. It's not, you know, it's similar to a bar, but it's not crazy. I don't want like the nightlife. It's a, it's a different experience than that. So startup costs, there's a lot going on right here, but what you really need to see is the subtotal is around 400 grand and three quarters of that is actually coming from your equipment and your construction build out. <clears throat> and then I'm looking for an extra 140 grand just for reserves and cash flow contingency and management reserves just to make sure anything come up that I didn't that I knew about that it might come up or I didn't even think about. Um, for a grand total startup cost of 540 grand. So I'm looking for 440 grand to start this business up, you know, in a couple of years. Just a question here, the beer inventory, someone's inventory, stuff, some of the stuff is I'm assuming one time, right? But then, right, and then other yeah. stuff though, the inventory, is that, you were talking about your first year projections, a certain amount of barrels, is that mm -hmm. gonna get, yeah, so is that variable right, exactly. cost that will? The beer inventory is for my projected first year sales uh, for six months, just to purchase the materials, the grains, the hops yeast and same with the food so you know it's a projection I might not need to buy that initially but I figured you know I'll, I'll have that money just in case and then you know the other stuff could be a one-time fee or it could be the similar to the, the inventory but initially the first thing you said you initially you're going to be doing just a retail location people coming in right, exactly. experience later you will be looking at dis you're not, distribution stuff is later yes exactly once I build like kind of like a following in the area and people know about my product, I'll reach out to distributors in the area who distribute the local craft beer, the ones that I showed earlier. There are distributors who actually move that around, so I'll reach out to them and then hopefully spark relationships so that they can pass my beer along. What about personnel? You know, bartenders. Yeah, so you'll need a someone to manage. Oh, I'll show you the next page. Uh, you're going to need a manager, a brewmaster, which I'll have to hire someone who's gone to an actual brewing school. And you know, I'm, I'm doing the home brewing, but I'm looking for a more professional product. Um, and it's not a high salary because it's such a sought after uh, <laughs> career. Uh, so I'll need a manager, a brewmaster, a cook, and bartenders or barbacks. And you know, I can do a lot of this initially, but these are just for uh, purposes of figuring out the business in the future. Um, and so as you can see from this, the, the variable costs and sales, so each barrel, which is about two kegs, uh, what you're used to, it can make you $431, and it costs about 30% of that to make it. And the same with the food, I was thinking about selling the, the Bark Burger with the chips for $5, and it costs about 30% to make that. And so with these numbers, we can get the break even, and which is about 459 barrels per year, I'm projecting that first year I'll probably be able to sell around 300 barrels, so I'll be in the red. But in the second year, I can probably get to 600, and then 1,000, and then actually the bigger breweries that I mentioned before in the area are at like three to 4,000, so you know I can get to that area in here. And the market's not saturated because one of them is actually opening up another location a few towns over. So you mentioned like the Blue Moon was the most successful, and that was the most popular. So, so how is it? Is it the artwork? Is it uh, Miller Coors owns the Blue Moon, mm -hmm. and I think you know they're able to use their massive marketing budget. I don't know if you've seen Blue Moon commercials. Um, slice of orange. Yeah, it's, it's like a wheat beer that they put like an orange slice on top of it, and it's pretty much in every bar that you go to right now. And people love it. I mean, I love it. It's a good beer. My wife, it's her favorite beer. So they make a good beer. They have a lot of money to back it up, and so that's why it's kind of doing so really well. Some of these craft beers have really odd, awkward names, or maybe trying to appeal to the uh, yeah. kind of market segment. A lot of the a lot of craft breweries are, like I mentioned, are trying to do the local thing, and so they'll name it after something locally, like the yeah. Sierra Nevada. That's not really a strange name, but Long Trail. Long Trail. Of Wapsie, right. Exactly. Yeah. It's where the Wapsie River meets Highway 67. So I want to build it up in that area and then kind of expand. And I think it's a unique enough name so that when it did expand outside that area, people kind of like sticks in their mind, you know. 
So I'm um, just taking like this year one, you're projecting a loss. I, I didn't see, um, I guess the uh, that built into your your startup costs because you're, you know, one of the biggest reasons that that companies fail in the early stages is not because they don't sell, because they're undercapitalized. Right. So you you definitely want to take a look at, um, you know, what you're projecting to lose, drain out in cash or burn out in cash in year one, and build that. Yeah, that's, that's a great point actually. That. That is a great point. I just had those reserves in there, but I, I, you're right, I should break that out exactly for that first year for how much I plan to lose, projecting how much I'm going to sell. So, can, can I say, I'm sorry, another question. So, I'm, I'm still trying to kind of struggling uh, with brewery versus. I grew up in upstate, I, I know brew pubs uh, yeah. pretty, pretty well. Kind of more, more of a restaurant destination, mm -hmm. craft beer, and a lot of people go to it. Is this a brewery you're talking about that serves like one thing, or is it uh, more of a brew pub type of concept? Uh, it just sounds like you have one one item, and people don't like that one item; they may not choose you. That's just uh, yeah. That's just for the food. The, the main idea. So basically, there's a distribution brewery and a brew pub. And the brew pub is just you're you're serving all the beer you brew on site, and you have kind of a restaurant, it's like a bar that makes their own beer. Basically, the distribution brewery. You're distributing your beer. You make all different types of beer. You distribute it in the area, and then a lot of them also have a tasting room, which is what I'm planning on doing. Having a place where people can come, and that's where I want to build it initially, so that I can in the future be a distribution. Like Captain brewery. Lawrence. Exactly. Like that. That's what I would love to own a place like that. So, what percentage of your business do you see coming from distribution through third parties versus? Initially, within the first two years, it's, it would be pretty much 100% tasting room on site, which the margins are higher, but you're not going to be able to sell as much. And once you spark a relationship with the distributor, you're going to be able to get probably 75% <coughs> of your revenue will come from that if you grow it to the right period. I mean, I've spoken with the owner of Captain Lawrence and the owner of Defiant Brewery in Pearl River, and that's where they are at. The, um, Captain Lawrence is doing very well for itself. And then um, the Defiant Brewery is about 50-50 right now, but they're moving more toward uh, a larger chunk of distribution. It's taken a long time. Uh, yeah. Just moved their homes for right now. Yeah. Yeah, they started in 2006. Both of them started in 2006. And then uh, Captain Lawrence moved to Elmsford this past year, and they're, they've done really well for themselves as they're in Elmsford. How big do you need to be to get a distributor interested? The, let me just pull it up. I mentioned these other ones. This guy right here does not distribute as a brew pub. He has about 500 um, barrels per year, but he's building himself up. He's building another um, warehouse where he's actually going to scale himself up. This guy does about 3,500 barrels per year, and he's in six states, and he has uh, probably 15 distributors. The thing about beer, it's a little different. It's highly regulated. You need distributors to distribute your beer. You can't really just go around selling your beer to everyone, you know? Um, and you need federal permits and state permits and city permits and everything like that. So you really need to spark a good relationship with the distributor to get your product out there. Um, so I mean, I, I would say the minimum is probably 500 barrels. You could probably even do it less. Um, I know there's they call them nano breweries that only have like a one barrel brew house system that actually distribute. But then it comes to like your margins. You gotta you gotta find the right number. Okay. Um, so the market validation. I'll, I'll pass out some beer if you guys are interested. If, you know, you're 21 and the professor thinks it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, if you want to take two cups to pass it, I got two different pale ales. Um, thing about this beer, if you don't, uh, if you don't really like um, beer, you probably won't like it. If you if you drink beer. That, just the mainstream beer, it might taste a little different. Let's start in case. Dr. Frick, come on up and come on. Come on. But, you know, I don't know if you guys were afterward, but as part of the class, let me come on up and try some beer. And um, I, I don't know you all yet, I would have to show that I took group in your undergrad, so. Sorry, even if you're 21. Uh, afterwards, if you want to do something outside of the class, that's fine, but I, I can't hear. Yeah, sorry. Nikhil's <laughs> <Yeah, later. laughs> working. Uh, he's a graduate. Student. I came on a transfer just in case it. This is a cool, but, um, 
So this is the first Bell L. Um, I had a market tasting, and this one received, it's the blue, you know, a little worse reviews than the next one I'm going to give you. It's got the same hops that I passed around right here. Cascade, and it's also got, it's called Kent Golding's hops. Kind of smell a little bit of the hops in it. Um, I like it. I think we passed it. Sorry. It's already good to have the same opportunity to serve the beer. That's what I'm saying. Just include the beer component even if you're not ready with your business. I like those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Exchange for some information. There's a craft beer festival in Washington, D.C. in March, which um, I'm signed up to go to, and they have a particular section about startup breweries where I hope to learn a lot about. Um, and then in June, I'm, I'm hoping to submit the offering packages to seek that 440 grand, potentially a little more with my first year losses now that you mentioned that. And what's your, to these investors, what's your, what's their, are, they, are you going to? 
Are they going to get like? Are they going to participate in the cash flow? Are they dividend? How are you, how are, what, how are you looking at it from a um, liquidity perspective? I bet I put a value together of the business I didn't have in the in the slides, but it was around seven hundred grand based on a project like a percentage of the projection of sales, four percent of sales over a five year period, the annual projection, plus the inventory like the beer that I had on site, plus. Um, the equipment you can you can has a pretty good resale value, so there's some value in that as well. So I valued it at 700 grand. So whatever you put in, say you put in 100 grand, you would get a seventh of the company. You know, I'd work it out like that. So I haven't I haven't uh, met with any lawyers or anything like that in terms of that. Okay, but you you guys may know. I mean, I don't know like certain at least with the restaurant industry, right? You typically like I think you sometimes get a percentage of cash flow. I'm not, I'm just curious, like, what do you think? The return would be for the investor. For the investor, investor. Would it be when you sell it to another brand, or would it be when you? Right. Um, well, with this, I mean, oops, sorry. Um, you know, I said in the second year I'd get around 600 barrels, and the third year 1,000 barrels. So that's the profit is right here, and so, you know, I'd have to think about whether I'd want to re uh, put that back into the business, or I want to, you know, hand it out in dividends. I think. I would probably do that, hand it out in dividends, and then you know, have a, like a ten-year goal of uh, a ten-year. I guess whether I want to sell the business or keep going, I would probably try to sell the business to a bigger brewery after ten years or something like that, and that's you know people will get hopefully a large return on their investment. Um, and then um, you know, starting next year, sign the property lease. You can't submit your permits for your permits or your licenses until you have a location. So sign the property lease. Um, order the brewing equipment takes about six months to manufacture it um, and two months to install it. And then I'm hoping in the end of the August, uh, the end of the summer in 2014 to open the brewery. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So